Hi everybody, welcome to our quick video on how to do a hand calculation for a one sample t-test. These steps are outlined in the PowerPoint that's in this module, but I wanted to walk us through it so that you can see it in real time as well. You might want to go ahead and get a piece of scratch paper and a calculator and then let's get started. First, remember that all t-tests are comparing two things. In the case of a one sample t-test, it's comparing a population and a sample. All t-tests also have three steps. Step one, we calculate the variance for the sample. Step two, we calculate the standard error. And step three, we calculate the final t-statistic for our data, which is also sometimes called the t-observed. These are gonna be the same three steps regardless of what kind of t-test it is. And while the formulas may look different, depending on the test we're doing, they are all still the same three steps. On the next slide, you can actually see our formulas. Keep in mind, if you are in our course and you have a PowerPoint that's supposed to have formulas in it and you can't see the formulas, all you need to do is download the PowerPoint to your PC and open it as a regular file rather than trying to view it through D2L. This is usually just a browser issue around display, okay? So if you can't see the formulas, download and open it as a regular file rather than trying to view it through our course page. As you can see, these are our three steps, and then these are the three formulas that go with each step. So let's get started with an example. So for your example, let's say you search the literature because, of course, the first step in any research is to read. So you search the background literature and you find that there's another researcher who has reported that the average stress score for college students is third. You hypothesize that your sample of college students has a significantly different stress score than the population average. That would be like if I decided that the students who are at Kennesaw are going to have a different stress score than other college students. Let's say you take a sample and your sample is going to be of 16 individuals for this example. Now, of course, in real research, you probably would never use only 16 students in a quantitative study. However, this will make the math much easier because, again, this is just an example. So you take your 16 individuals and you administer them the same stress measure that the other researcher used. And when you do that, you find that your sample of students has an an average of 33 on that stress score and a sum of squares that is equal to 240. Your question is, is the sample significantly different than the population? Before we get too far ahead, I want you to think to yourself, is this a one tail test or two tail test? How do we tell? Well, the way we tell is by the hypothesis. So let's look back at our screen. You hypothesize that your sample of students has a significantly different stress score than the population average. Is that a directional hypothesis or a non-directional hypothesis? Say it out loud. It's a non-directional hypothesis. It's because the hypothesis is not picking a specific direction for the outcome. It did not say their scores would be higher or lower. It just said different. And so because it's non-directional, we're looking at both higher and lower as a possibility. Thus, this is a two-tailed test. So we're going to have a two-tailed hypothesis test. Now I'm starting here. Those answers are on a, uh, a slide in the future. Um, but I want us to get used to being able to identify the hypothesis and what kind of tail test we're doing as soon as possible. Now, where do we start? Well, all three t-tests have the same three steps. So step one is to find the variance for the sample. I can do this by just going back to this slide and grabbing our formula and pasting it here. So what this says is that the sample variance, S2, is equal to the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. Now remember, degrees of freedom, the formula for that is n minus 1. So I can go ahead and replace our denominator with the formula n minus 1. Now we can just plug in the information that we have. Our sum of squares was given to us, so it's 240. Our denominator is still n minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom. You have 16 people in your study, so it's 16 minus 1. 16 minus 1 is 15, so we can go ahead and replace our denominator with 15. Now I can just plug this into a calculator to come up with the answer. Go ahead and do that yourself. You should get 16. 
and it's an even 16, so 16.000. Now, one of the ways I've built these PowerPoints is so that you can follow along. So if you go ahead and go to the next slide, you can see that the next two slides help walk you through this. This is so that even if there's not a video, you can walk step by step through these slides and practice these hand calculations yourself. So let's get back to our example. So we now know that the sample variance is 16. So now we can move to step two, which is to calculate the standard error. Again, I can just pop back to the right slide, grab the formula, and then move forward. So the formula is the standard error equals the square root of the sample variance divided by n, which is the sample size. Let's plug in the information that we know. We just found the sample variance, so we can replace that. That's 16. We also know that we have 16 individuals in our study. So we can replace the denominator with the number of people in the study, which is also 16. Now, typically, these numbers are not going to be the same number. I've done this because, again, this is just an example. It's a practice problem for you to get used to working with these three formulas. Okay? So it's not normal that they're the same number. It's just how it worked out. Okay? But now we can resolve this. We have to do what's underneath the square root first. So we divide 16 by 16, which is 1. Anything divided by itself is, of course, 1. The square root of 1 is also 1. But the process is the same. You take the standard, the sample variance that you just found, you divide it by the number of people in the study. You do that first, and then you take the square root of that number. For this example, again, it's going to be 1.00. Now that we know both the sample variance and the standard error, we can move on to step three, which is to calculate our T statistic, which is our T observed for this data set. Again, I go back to this slide and I pull our correct formula and paste it forward. What this formula says is that t equals the sample average minus the population average divided by the standard error. Capital M is a sample average and mu is a population average. So now we can again plug in the information we know from the paragraph that describes our study. Our sample average is 33. The standard error that we just found is 1.0. So we're left with what is the population average. Well, we were also given that. Remember, the researcher reported that the average stress score for all college students is 30. So we can replace mu with 30. 33 minus 30 is 3. And 3 divided by 1 is 3. So for this example, our T observed is 3.00. However, the question is, is your sample significantly different than the population? All I know is the T observed. To find out whether or not this is statistically significant, we have one more step, and that's to get the critical value from the T table. So let's go to our course page and grab that. On our course page, you should find uh, a T chart. I have tried to make this chart as accessible as possible, the previous version was PDF and it was very hard to read. Let's walk through how you use the T-chart. And this is true whether or not you use my T-chart or another one you find on the internet or the one in your book. Though I would say it's probably best to use the one that I've provided you. The T-chart is made up of T critical values. These critical values are the minimum threshold that your T observed needs to be to be able to say that it is statistically significantly different. The first column on the left are all the potential degrees of freedom. It goes up to 120 and then skips to infinity. Then we have four columns. Now, if you use a T-chart in another class or find one on the internet, you'll see that it has way more columns than this. That's because I've deleted the columns that are unnecessary. In psychology, we tend to only use alpha level 0.05 and alpha level 0.01. So that's why this one's much smaller than some of the other ones that you may see and why I think it's easier for you to use this one. What you have to know is whether or not you're using a one or two tailed test. If you're using a one tailed test, you would use this column here, which is the second column that says proportionate in one tail 0.05. That would be a one tailed test with an alpha level of 0.05. If you're using a one tail test, you might also use the fourth column which is the proportion in one tail 0.01. This is 
the T critical value if you're using a one-tailed test and you want to increase your alpha to 0.01 to make it even harder to get a statistically significant result. In between those are also the proportion in two tails for the 0.05 alpha level and the 0.01 alpha level. So you need to know three things before you get started. You need to know the degrees of freedom for your sample, whether or not it's a one or two tail test, and what the alpha level is. If I don't give you a specific alpha level, it just defaults to 0.05. So for this example, I didn't tell you a specific alpha level. So we know it defaults to 0.05. We also already talked about that this is a two-tail test. So we are going to be using the third column here, the one that says proportion in two tails combined, 0.05. As you can see, as the degrees of freedom increase, the critical values decrease. This is because as you've learned from the other content in the module, as we increase the degrees of freedom, the T distribution starts to resemble the normal distribution even more. And thus, your T critical value goes down. So we need to find our sample size. Well, we had 16 people, which means our degrees of freedom is 15. So here's the row for 15 highlighted. Again, we're doing a two-tail test and the alpha level is not specific, which means it defaults to 0.05, which means our T critical value is 2.131. That's how you use the chart. You go down on the left, the number equal to the degrees of freedom for your sample, and then you go across and find the correct number for whether or not this is a one or two tail test and whether or not your alpha level is 0.05 or 0.01. So as you can see from going to the next slide, that is indeed the correct T critical value, 2.131. Now what you should know is that these values are actually absolute values. So it's actually positive 2.131 and negative 2.131. Think about it this way. The T distribution for this particular degrees of freedom, this particular distribution of scores, the boundaries that mark the critical regions that separate the middle of the distribution from the tails, those boundaries are negative 2.131 and positive 2.131. Our T value, the T observed, right, is 3.0, which means it's over here in the right extreme tail. And I know that because three is greater than our critical value, which again, you can think of as the minimum threshold for being in the tail and being significant or not. If instead our T value that we observed for the study was let's say positive 1.56, then it would not be in the tail. Instead, it would be here in the regular part of the distribution. It would not be beyond in the tail. And I know that because, again, 1.56 is less than 2.131. Think of those critical values as the minimum threshold. You have to be more than that. On the flip side, if our number was negative, it would still be statistically significant because negative 3.0 is more negative is further beyond negative 2.131. So that would also be statistically significantly different. And again, if it was instead negative 1.56, it would not have met the threshold and would not be statistically significant. So for our example, our T observed is beyond the T critical threshold, which means it is in the extreme tails, which means it is statistically significant. So yes, we can say that our sample is different than the population. We can actually go one step further. We know that the average score for our sample is 33, and 33 is greater than the population average of 30. So we can also say that they are more stressed. And we know this because our T value was positive and our mean is higher. If our T value instead was negative, our mean would be lower than 33. It would be lower than 30. If it was 27 or something like that, your T value would have been negative. And if so, then we would have said they were less stressed. So we're gonna reject the null hypothesis and we are going to support our actual hypothesis, our research hypothesis. We're gonna support that one. And again, we can go one step further and say that they are not only different, they are more stressed. So hopefully, 
this helped you through these calculations. Again, I can't promise that every future module will have a video devoted to the hand calculations because the PowerPoints are set up for you to be able to go slide by slide and do them yourself and follow along. But I hope this was helpful to get us started. If you have any questions, you can always email me or post to the FAQ board. I'll see you online.